Uh, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of the invitation to participate in this conference. Uh, it has been exciting. Now, I, Marisol, I believe you have my slides. So uh, you'll be presenting the slides. There you go. Very good. Thank you. Um, what a conference. I've just got to pause just a moment and express my uh, appreciation for our, our previous speakers and the expertise and the content. I, I got to tell you, I feel like I'm being put in a, a baseball game to pitch with like a 15 run lead. The, the content that we've received is so appreciative. Um, I would also like to uh, take just a moment of personal privilege to say hello to Sarah, my previous colleague, uh, former colleague there at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And then also to uh, express to um, Amy Martin uh, my, my appreciation for going ahead and calibrating our listeners so that they'll be ready for this Southern draw. Um, I, would, I will admit that I sought and received indulgence from our host to veer a little wider from the content on the agenda, because I knew when I looked at the agenda that uh, the experts would have already be spoke, speaking and there was more to come this afternoon. But as we look at this, I, this, the issue of rural culture and health impact, I want to just veer and go a little bit off track of the objectives and, uh, and you'll see where it ties in. Now, if I'm to speak on the subject of rural culture and, and health impact, uh, there's, I'm almost required to very briefly tell you a little about my experience. You see, I grew up rural and I've always been around healthcare. My first non-agricultural job was at the age of 16 when I went to work at my grandmother's long-term care facility, we called them nursing homes back then. And you can see that it led to my educational and career choices for the rest of my life. I've always lived in rural, at least the majority of my life. I grew up in southeastern Oklahoma. I went off to pharmacy school in southwestern Oklahoma, moved back again uh, to have a career in pharmacy in southeastern Oklahoma. I know rural health. Uh, I've been a rural pharmacist in a rural community for over 35 years, 20 years of that as a pharmacy owner. Uh, I've had the privilege to be the CEO of a county health care authority that had a hospital, a home health agency, a EMS, a rural health clinic. So I've touched all areas of rural providers. In fact, I'll tell you this, I first moved to a metropolitan, metropolitan statistical area in 2007. I moved up near Oklahoma City and that was to be near the grandbabies that we were starting to receive. Uh, in 2010, I moved to Washington DC to be part of your federal office of rural health policy. And even uh, a moved and spent a couple of years in the Boston area once again to follow that newest grandbaby that we had. My point is just this. My first 53 years of my life, all I'd lived was small town rural culture. It was normal for me. That's what culture is. It's a set of norms influenced by geography, but other societal and behavioral and structural factors, not the least of which is time. Uh, culture changes over time. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, you couldn't go to a cafe and eat a meal without a side order of cigarette smoke. Now, just imagine that now. Culture changes over time. I'd also like to say, as a former Fed, I'm appreciative that the CDC chose to shine a light on these disparities that we're talking about. Uh, next slide. In, in 2017, the CDC published 13 rural focus studies in their uh, MMWR series, including a report on the leading causes of death in America. And this report revealed that the five diseases that claim the most urban lives also claim the most rural lives, heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic lower respiratory diseases, and unintentional in injuries. Now, there's no surprise there. The study also provided a look into potentially excess deaths or what they call avoidable deaths, often associated with rural factors. Uh, two years later, the CDC issued a follow-up report. And that report also examined the leading causes of death uh, deeper using a six category urban rural classification slide. And the 2019 report again found increasing rural excess deaths for heart disease unintentional injuries, 
which notably uh, to Sarah's uh, presentation there includes opioid related deaths and chronic lower respiratory diseases. And it also revealed that the more rural the population, the worse the numbers got. By the way, the highest death rate disparity between the most rural counties and the urban areas was associated with chronic lower respiratory disease, 57% compared with 13%. Now, if you think about that from a rural perspective, that's not the best news for rural if you're about to confront a respiratory coronavirus pandemic. Next slide. What else do we know about the rural health landscape? On the average as a population, rural folks tend to live shorter lives. Rural women experience higher maternal mortality rates. We tend to participate more in unhealthy behavior and we suffer the resultant health consequences of that. We have less access to and utilization of mental health service and providers. Uh, we're finding fewer and fewer local clinicians and healthcare choices making it more difficult to access emergency care, specialty care, and preventive care. And rural folks are more likely than urban folks to be paying out of pocket for whatever health care they can access, including oral health services. Next slide. What oral health disparities are present in rural America? Once again, I knew the content experts would be ahead of me. And uh, you've already gotten a good picture of this, but I'll just recap them for you. Rural adults are less likely to visit the dentist than urban adults. 55.7% uh, of adults age 18 to 64 are living outside of a metropolitan statistical area. Uh, they visited the dentist in the past year, 65% uh, in urban areas. The South Carolina Rural Health Research Center, Dr. Amy Martin has already spoken with you. They reported rural children were less likely to receive preventive dental care than urban children. Rural children are also less likely to report having excellent or very good teeth. In a 2013 report, it shows rural counties have higher percentages of people having several teeth pulled and counties with the high rates of full edentialism having all their teeth pulled are also rural. Seniors in rural areas are less likely than their suburban or urban counterparts to have visited the dentist in the past year. And they're more likely to have all their teeth removed due to decay or gum disease. Next slide. At our uh, meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina in the fall of 2018, the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services identified several factors that contribute to the problems of accessing dental care in rural America. Uh, one is that there are fewer dental health professionals in rural areas resulting in people having to travel further to obtain oral health care. Rural populations often cannot afford dental health care or purchase dental health insurance. Rural America has a higher percentage of people age 65 and older who are less likely to have employer provided dental coverage and Medicare still does not provide dental benefits. Approximately 34 million Americans reside in rural or partially rural areas that have been designated by HRSA as dental health professional shortage area. Uh, you, you hear the term HIPSAs or a dental HIPSA. Uh, 34 million Americans are, reside in those areas. Uh, in some states, to address this dental professional shortage, there's things such as expanded function dental hygienists or other mid-level practitioners have been approved to practice. However, this, the scope of practice for these practitioners varies widely from state to state. According to the 2018 data from the American Dental Association, approximately two thirds of all dentists in the US did not serve Medicaid patients. So just looking at those, when confounded by issues such as the lack of fluoridated water in rural areas and poor oral health literacy, we could conclude that these systemic barriers are enough in themselves to account for the existing oral health disparities. But this is where I veer. I want us to pause for just a moment and ask ourselves the question, is there something additional going on in rural culture? Next slide. 
you know the saying, never, never waste a good crisis. Well, COVID-19 is the greatest healthcare crisis in a hundred years. Duh. So let's take that. What does the pandemic reveal to us in particular about rural culture? I'll ask you to re recall that previous chart uh, ranking the leading causes of death in US. That was from 2013. And recall it's number one, heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, unintentional injuries, and it included at that point uh, drug overdoses. And the number five, rounding out the top five, was stroke. Now I want you to look at this chart, uh, September of this year, the leading causes of death in the US. And you'll notice there's been a definite rearranging. Uh, heart disease is still at this point number one. Uh, if you look though, uh, COVID is number two, but it was the leading cause of death back in January. It even eclipsed heart disease prior to the vaccination rollout. In third place now is cancer. Uh, in fourth place is unintentional injuries, uh, including the drug overdoses that Sarah spoke of. And then also uh, number five comes stroke. And then number six is chronic lower respiratory disease from, went from third place to sixth place. Now, for those of you that are optimistically looking for some good news on this slide, uh, pause just a moment. The reason that uh, chronic lower respiratory disease or COPD uh, went from third place down to sixth place is not because it got better, it's because it was number one, eclipsed by COVID. Uh, number two, eclipsed by uh, opioid overdose deaths. And number three, uh, even COPD hasn't improved because patients are not, patients are succumbing to COVID-19 during the pandemic and they're not being reflected in the uh, COPD death toll. They're up there in the COVID death toll. Next slide. Um, on Wednesday, September 16th of 2020, just a little over a year ago now, I learned that my 93-year-old father, who, by the way, was on his self-proclaimed journey to 104 years old, I learned that he had been exposed to the coronavirus by a member of his staff at the long-term care facility where he lives, and that he was being tested for the virus. The next day, I was notified that dad's test was positive for COVID-19. Dad passed away the following Monday morning. I wish the vaccines had been available then. I'm grateful that the vaccines are available now. I just wish more people were getting vaccinated. The vaccines work. And it grieves me as I look at this slide that over 90,000 COVID-19 deaths since June of 2021 likely would have been prevented with vaccinations. Next slide. There is so much to hate about how this COVID pandemic is playing out, but I must admit, this is the one of the most perplexing, disturbing, frustrating headlines I've encountered. COVID-19 is now killing rural Americans at twice the rate of people in urban areas. And the focus on deaths affecting mainly the elderly is unfortunate because it's likely created a false sense of security among younger and healthier folks that has led to lower vaccination rates and resistance to preventive measures and mitigation strategies. And now tragically, we're seeing growing death rates. Now at the time of this chart, the latest COVID, COVID deaths were concentrated in the South and they included more younger people than before. In fact, every age group under 55 saw its highest death toll of the pandemic in this past August. And according to the CDC, the number of people in their 30s who died of the virus in August was about 50% higher than the number who died in January, the month with the highest number of deaths recorded in US. Next slide. It's been said that hardship builds character. I think I remember my mom saying that. It's also been said crisis reveals character. Now, each of the characteristics that are listed on this, uh, on this list are positive. 
and historic and to the appeal of rural culture. Hardship builds character, but crisis reveals character. Perhaps the pandemic has revealed an, another aspect of rural culture that also serves as barriers to care. If so, what does the pandemic reveal to us in particular to rural culture? Next slide. So I'm grateful for the timely publication of my friend's article. Uh, it came out on September 29th and Kay sent it to me in the midst of my grappling with this issue. Uh, I'd call it a pandemic in induced quandary I was having around the topic of rural culture. And the article helped me see that it doesn't matter if the challenge is preventive care or specialty care or rural oral health care, the rural culture issues are the same. So what is the public health crisis telling me in particular to rural culture? Well, first of all, uh, thank you to Alan Morgan that started it off with telling us that uh, rural is older, sicker, and poorer. But what the pandemic's telling me is it's not all just about older, sicker, and poorer. And this is why. Number one, rural seniors are doing better than younger folks at getting vaccinated. Number two, comorbidities increase with COVID-19 hospitalization and death rates, but not with COVID infection rates. Number three, even the economic challenges and the related barriers like distance and transportation. Let's admit it, the vaccine is pretty, pretty much available now and, it, and it's free. What else is the, pan, the pandemic telling me about this particular rural culture? It, it's also telling me that it's not just about access to local healthcare and infrastructure or even rural health workforce. And while there are social determinants of health, that are unique to rural populations, there are also co rural cultural characteristics that can be beneficial or can serve as barriers to improved rural health and rural oral health. Next slide. Part of these characteristics, as you're looking at the list there, part of these characteristics of culture include how rural residents themselves define health. There's consistent themes and they suggest that the rural populations tend to emphasize more functional aspects of health, things like preserving the ability to work or being able to continue in traditional roles. Um, additionally, rural folks tend to frame health in terms of independence and self-sufficiency. They're willing to accept ill health with a higher degree of stoicism and, and seemingly more fatalism. Uh, well, let me ask you just a question. Who of you has heard folks say, well, I'll just take my chances. If it's my time, it's my time. So I want us to do something. I want us to look at these rural cultural characteristics one more time, but this time in light of what we are seeing during the current pandemic. Start off with the importance of family. Um, undeniable. Uh, that's a very strong characteristic in rural. Any of you know, however, anyone avoiding friends or family this Thanksgiving because they hold strongly different perspectives on COVID mitigation strategies? Anybody know of anybody having fallout with their friends or family over that? Uh, second, we see a strong sense of independence. And I think we can agree on this. It's a good thing until it becomes harmful to yourself or others. A connection to land or place. You know, I see this reflected in a kind of a going along to get along with local trends and perspectives. Even if you don't necessarily agree, it's a matter of you, you more want to fit in. I was uh, visiting with a very close friend from my hometown that I grew up in, and we were scratching our heads about why people weren't getting the vaccine and why they were risking uh, severe illness. And, and he made the statement, Paul, you haven't lived here in a while. Things are different. And so there's a, a, a direct connection to the land or place that's kind of a, like I said, a, you just kind of go along even if you don't agree. Uh, conservatism. Now, I've always considered myself a conservative. And uh, I, I see this now as the more of a, a 
getting caught up in groupthink. It's it's kind of like it's an information source driven change to what they how they define conservatism. It's uh it's about what it means to be a conservative. It's I used to think of it more as being principled. Now it's more transactional, uh, more pragmatic is the way I used to see it. Now it seems it's uh, more conspiracy driven. And the influence of faith. Uh, I've seen this manifested in at least two contexts. The first context is a sort of a thinking somehow that standing on the promises precludes trusting in the science or the second way, perhaps even in its worst form, I see a demanding of personal rights that stand in contrast with long held tenets of faith. Tenets such as looking out for the interest of others or using our freedom to serve one another or protecting the most vulnerable in our midst. Uh, use of informal networks taken from uh, Kay's list there. I recall when I was little going to the barber shop with my dad on Saturday mornings, even when we didn't need a haircut. That was his informal network. That's where he caught up on all the news and everything that was going on. Uh, obviously, times have changed. But uh, have you noticed that people are more aggressive sharing their opinions online than in person? And even then, that aggressive opinion that they're sharing is usually just by posting someone else's original thought. Times have changed, but crisis reveals character. And while there are definitely positive aspects to these rural cultural characteristics, they can also present barriers to care. Next slide. Well, you know, I, I uh, looking at my time, I'm gonna pull up right here and stop. And in case there may be time for some questions, I'll toss it over to Dr. Brand. But before I do, I just want you to understand there's no disparaging rural folks intended on my part today. These are my people. We can celebrate the vibrancy and cultural uh, culture of rural places, as well as illuminate the disparities and the challenges. But if we want to improve our nation's rural health, if we want to improve rural oral health, especially among minority and marginalized populations and communities, as Dr. Perkins has so well uh, described this morning. It's also important to recognize the dynamics of rural culture at work. Well, thank you again for this opportunity to be with you, to veer a little wider, to hopefully provoke some thought with you that uh, you'll take back and share with your rural communities in a way that is helpful to them and uh, for the privilege of being with you today. Thank you.